Good morning. morning. We're really glad to have uh, those of you who are with us in person. I know it may have been difficult to get here today, so thanks for braving the snow in the streets. For our online uh, participants, we're very glad to have you as well, and we're so thankful for that growing community, and even for those who may uh, end up watching this sometime later, uh, we want to welcome you, and we're grateful that you're part of this family. I do want to encourage you to open a Bible, physical or digital, to the book of Jonah as we continue that series this morning. Ed Conlon wrote a book called Blue Blood in which he uh, talks about his career in uh, the NYPD. And he shares a story of a time when he was on a security detail at Shea Stadium for a baseball game. When the game was over, he was located out in the parking lot of Shea Stadium. And as uh, cars were pulling out of the parking lot, sometimes people would stop and ask him directions. They weren't sure how to get from where they were to where they wanted to go, especially those who had come from out of town for the game. Sometimes Colin knew exactly how to get them where they needed to go. Sometimes he didn't. And so when that was the case, he, he would just say, I, I have no idea. But he said many times when that was his response, it resulted in anger and, and debate from the drivers. And finally, Colin had just had enough of that. And so he decided to change tactics. And so as the cars continued to exit the large parking lot and the occasional one would would stop and ask him directions from here to there, he decided that he would would tell everybody the same thing. He would just say, take the next left. And so every car that stopped from that point forward, even if he had no idea how to get them where they were going, he would just say, well, take the next left. And so he wrote, for all I know, those people are still lost in Queens. Well, sometimes we really do need directions. We, we could use the help of somebody who knows how to get from where we are to where we want to go. And the last thing that we need is somebody who just says, oh, take the next left. What we really need is somebody who knows the way and knows how to tell us how to get down that way. And that is is one of the blessings of the book of Jonah. In one way, the book of Jonah is really a book of directions. Because we get to follow Jonah as God leads him from where he is to where he needs to be. We get to watch this physically and geographically as God leads Jonah to Joppa, and then as Jonah heads to a ship, and then to a fish, and then to a beach, and then, and then finally to the city of Nineveh. But we also get to watch this happen emotionally, spiritually, as Jonah progresses from the rebellious, disobedient, biased servant of God to at least the servant of God who eventually makes his way to Nineveh to fulfill the preaching of the word of the Lord. And so in many ways, the book is a book of directions that can show us a little bit about how God leads us from where we are to where we would like to be. So How does God do this? How does God get Jonah from where he is to where he needs to be? How does God get us from where we are to where we need to be? We get a little glimpse of this in verse 17 with the first few words, and the Lord appointed, or in the translation that was read earlier, and the Lord provided, because this word appointed means to provide, means to supply. We're going to see this word several times in the book as God supplies, chapter 4, verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed or supplied a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. 
chapter 4, verse 7, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed, provided, supplied a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered, chapter 4, verse 8. When the sun rose, God appointed, supplied, provided a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. The story begins in chapter 1, verse 17, with God supplying, God providing, God appointing something that Jonah needs to get him from where he is to where he needs to go. And so at a very foundation level, the book professes that we can trust. We can trust that God will provide whatever is needed to move us in the right direction in our journey. Here we are at the beginning of the new year. Some of us have spent some time thinking about this new year and considering where we as individuals would like to be by the end of this new year. And the book of Jonah would tell us you can trust that God will provide what you need to get from where you are to where you want to be by the end of the year. Here we are a, a few weeks as a congregation removed from Vision Sunday and a treasurer's report where we talked about some of the things that God may want to do through us in this year and financially where we are and where we need to be by the end of the year. And the book of Jonah would tell us you can trust. We can trust that God will provide this congregation what we need to get from where we are to where we need to be. Here we are on the cusp of Black History Month, the month of February, a time when our nation takes stock of where we've been, where we still need to go in terms of racial equity and justice. And the book of Jonah would tell us you, we can trust that God will provide what we need to move along in that journey. But it may not be the provision that we want. Imagine if you could play the role of God for Jonah in the book of Jonah. And it was your responsibility to get Jonah to move along in this journey, to, to get on to Nineveh and to being a, a, a better person for the purpose and mission of God. I wonder how you would complete this sentence for Jonah and the Lord provided. What would you give Jonah? Well, some of us might give Jonah our, our Holy Spirit. Let's send the Holy Spirit down. Let the Spirit come down on Jonah. Bring a little conviction in his heart, a little transformation on the inside. Some of us might send another prophet or someone to come alongside Jonah and say, Come on, you're supposed to be going to Nineveh, not to Tarshish. Some of us might send a scroll, a scripture, a, a, a book with some insight that Jonah might read so that he gets the sense, okay, this is where we need to be going. I wonder as you think about yourself and your own journey, as, as you think about this church and this church's journey, as you think about this nation and this nation's journey, I wonder how you would complete that sentence. What are you hoping that God will provide you, us, to move us along in our journey? Because what we hope God will provide may not be what he provides because it's, it's not what is provided in the book of Jonah. Chapter 1, verse 17, And the Lord appointed, provided, supplied a great fish to swallow up Jonah. To move Jonah in the right direction in his journey, God provided a belly. Three more times in this story, we're told that where Jonah finds himself is the belly of a great fish. Jonah 1 verse 17, again, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the, the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from the belly of the fish saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. In order to get Jonah where he needed to be, 
God provided a belly. And this was not a pleasant experience. This was not the Disney belly of Monstro the whale when Monstro swallows Pinocchio, Cleo, and Geppetto. And the inside, we're looking from the inside out of Monstro's mouth and belly, is so cavernous that the three of them have room to swim around and stand up and build a boat and try to escape. That is not the experience of Jonah. What Jonah experiences is a place of great limitation, great restraint, the loss of virtually all freedoms and the presence of hardship. Jonah calls it the belly of Sheol, Sheol being the abode of the dead. In other words, a grave. In order to move Jonah along on his journey, what God supplies is a place of confinement and restriction, a place of suffering and hardship. Now we have to acknowledge that even that did not completely transform Jonah. Even after this belly experience in chapters 3 and 4, Jonah is still rebellious. Jonah is still biased against the Ninevites, but at least he gets to Nineveh. In order to get Jonah where he needed to be, this excruciatingly difficult belly experience was necessary. And it turns out that this belly was not just a belly, it was a womb. Scholars point out that the, the gender of the word used in the text here changes. In chapter 2, verse 1, the word belly is masculine. In chapter 2, verse 2, the word belly is feminine. Suggesting that where Jonah finds himself is not just a tight and restricted space. It is also a place of rebirth, of renewal. It is a womb from which he emerges a somewhat different man. And the same is very true for us. Often, in order to help us move from where we are to where we need to be, God allows us to spend time in bellies, to have seasons of life where we're no longer able to do what we used to do, where we can't seem to do what we want to do, where there's a loss of freedom, a loss of capacity, the presence of pain and hardship. And, and these belly experiences take all sorts of forms in our time. A cancer diagnosis, a parent's divorce, a dream that we've held onto for a very long time, finally being crushed. And, and that's not to say that all of the bad things that we experience in life are appointed by God in the same way the fish, the plant, the worm, the wind were appointed. But it is to say that the God portrayed in this story is a God who is able to take excruciatingly difficult experiences and use them to move us along in our journey. Some of us in this room attended a funeral over the last week that was deeply painful. Over this last week, I talked with someone connected to this church who lives in chronic pain. I know someone close to this church who lost a job this week. I spoke this week with a woman who experienced physical abuse in her marriage. I spoke with someone this week who 
was kicked out of a faith community because she was gay. And I don't know what to make of all of these difficult experiences that we experience in our lives, but I do know that the God of the story of Jacob is a God who somehow is able to take these experiences and do with them what he did for Jonah in the belly of the fish to move us further along in our journey. Bell Hooks, in her book All About Love, wrote, Contrary to what we may have been taught to think, unnecessary and unchosen suffering wounds us but need not scar us for life. It does mark us. What we allow the mark of our suffering is in our own hands. In his collection of essays, The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin writes about suffering in the healing process, stating, I do not mean to be sentimental about suffering, but people who cannot suffer never grow up, can never discover who they are. Growing up is, at heart, the process of learning to take responsibility for whatever happens in your life. To choose growth is to embrace a love that heals. It is often these belly experiences that allow us to grow up and to move on in the journey. And that's what allows Jonah to pray in the way that he prays from the belly of the fish. Scholars point out that many of the phrases that Jonah prays come right from the book of Psalms. But they don't come from the Psalms we think they would come from. They don't necessarily come from the Psalms of Lament. Psalms of Lament are those places where someone's suffering and they raise all sorts of questions and, and accusations and, and doubts to God. And, and that's very appropriate. But what Jonah seems to draw from are what are called the prayers of thanksgiving. In the prayers of thanksgiving, a person is suffering and able to give thanks to God, noting that God is still present, still active, even in the midst of this difficult situation. And so we note Jonah's prayer, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is Jonah in so many ways telling us that there is actually a blessing to being in a belly. The very thing we hate, the very thing we want to be as far away from as we can may actually contain a blessing. Because it is in the belly, it's in these seasons of suffering and hardship in our life where we come to know what Jonah says at the end, that salvation is from the Lord. We experience the salvation of God in new and fresh ways in these difficult moments of life, in ways that we never would experience any other way. And so there truly is a blessing to be found in the belly, which I think is one of the reasons why Jesus uses this image to talk about his own journey. Matthew 12, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. As Jesus thought about his journey and the next steps of the cross and the tomb, the story of Jonah is what came to his mind. Because he knew that this difficult experience he was about to enter into 
was not going to be the end. Did not define the entire journey. And was a necessary part of a longer journey. And we have all been blessed by Jesus' own journey into the belly. I want to encourage you to do as Jesus did, to allow this story of Jonah to become a way in which you frame the difficult moment that you're in or may be in in the near future. It doesn't have to define your journey. It's not the end of the journey. But if you'll allow it, it can be part of the way in which God gets you from where you are to where you need to be. Let's close this morning in just a moment of silence, meditating on this question. How has God used a belly for a blessing in my life?